Hello, my name is John Sayer, Technical Marketing Manager, Civil Infrastructure here at Autodesk. Today I would like to introduce you to the second of three episodes in a series called AutoCAD Civil 3D and SSA Workflow Overview. The second episode is Detention Pond Design Workflow. That being said, let's get started. As stated in the previous episode, in this series we will cover several key areas. The first episode we covered settings for import and export from Civil 3D to SSA. In this episode we will cover detention pond design workflow and to wrap it up in the third episode we will cover inlet and pipe design workflow. So let's get right to it. In episode two here we're going to cover detention pond design workflow. When designing detention ponds there are some key steps that you walk through in the workflow that get you from start to finish. And it's not like it's different on every job. It's the same workflow, it's just a different project. Now there will be some caveats that you come up against in each job, but that's what makes it design. We're gonna start off by gathering watershed data for our site for pre and post. We're gonna talk about how to get time of concentration line for the pre and post. We'll gather soils information because we need to know what types of soils that we're dealing with. We will compute a weighted RCN or runoff curve number for our site. We will size the proposed detention pond we will select an outlet control structure and, and size that structure uh, so that we can be sure that we're hitting the pre-development requirement. We will run our final routing and at the end we'll create a report. So we've got a lot to do, so let's get started. To give you a bit of background about this project, we've been asked to perform a drainage study so that we can size a detention pond, inlets, and pipe for this subdivision. So let's get started with the detention pond design. Again, we will start with gathering watershed data for the pre and the post development conditions. So in this particular instance, our detention pond area is gonna be up here in the northwest corner of the property. So we need to figure what drainage area for the pre and the post is, is getting to this point so that we can start our design. So when I refer to the pre and the post development, I'm talking about pre-development would be as if there was no lots here on the ground and this was just an open field which is what this was. Post-development would be as if it's in a developed condition. Now the areas will differ. What, what it's going to pull this drainage area from right now is the existing contours. The post-development condition would definitely be figured differently because a lot of times in this condition this slope is going this way for these lots so we will just include to the 25 foot setback around the road and you'll see that the post development condition will look different so there will be more area for it. I'm going to show you how to run a catchment. That catchment will actually give us our pre-developed condition. We're going to go up to analyze. We're going to select catchments and catchment area. I'm going to select my surface that I want to pull it from and I'll pick my point, my low point, where I think it is that I want to go. You can see it's kind of light, but you can see that it generated my catchment or my drainage area for everything to that low point. So I've actually gone in and I did this, uh, I traced this where I thought that the, the drainage area should be. So I'll turn that on real quick because I've got that in another layer. I can turn on my detention pond pre-developed drainage area. You can see it matched what I had actually uh, drawn up by hand. Now the difference, you saw how long it took to do that catchment. Okay, it took maybe 10-15 seconds to build that catchment for that drainage area to that point. Um, it took me probably 10-15 minutes to draw this line and get it where I thought it should be. It is a definite benefit to gathering your pre-development drainage area by using catchments, but for the sake of time today, um, I've got the other, the post-development drainage area done. You would have to have a surface for the post development so it would have to be a design surface so I know where the drainage area needs to be and what all it's going to encompass so I've drawn another line for the post development. One thing you need to remember with catchments is that they're only as good as the surface that you've got meaning if you have a surface and the surface has got problems your catchment areas will not return correctly so be sure that you have a very good surface that you can pull that catchment from. So now that we've got our pre-development drainage area we need to go ahead and I'll show you the post development drainage area that I came up with or that I have. So I'll go ahead and turn it on so you can see. 
there it is right there it's in yellow so you can see that the area is larger so our areas are going to be different that is going to be uh, something that happens on most projects sometimes you get a job that won't it won't be different it'll be the same area uh, but your curve numbers will be different we'll talk about curve numbers here in just a second and that's what's going to create the disparity in your detention pond the next step that we have in detention pond design is getting a TC which is a time of concentration line so whenever you're looking at time of concentration you want to start at the farthest point in your watershed to your low point so the farthest point in our watershed is right here and it's going to travel along the contour staying perpendicular to the contours until it gets to the low point you want to pick the furthest point in your watershed to do that I have got a TC for the consideration of time I've got a pre-development and a post-development time of concentration line that we can look at here that I've drawn on the plan. Uh, you can do this with a catchment um, and, and actually have it throw the time of concentration line on. It did the same TC line, so I just saved them in a layer here. So you can have the catchment build the TC line also. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my layer for my TC lines. So I've got a TC post, a TC pre. So let's just look at the pre first. All right, the pre time of concentration line starts here at the furthest point and comes down and follows the contours to the low point. Now the post development time of concentration will follow along the same line, but once it hits the road, we're just going to assume that it's five minutes from that point to the pond because you're in a pipe condition then. So uh, it's, it's like channelized flow. Uh, so if you hear that type of wording or nomenclature, channelized flow is either in like a gutter or a ditch or some sort of formed channel. Uh, pipe is also considered a channelized flow. And once it gets in there, you could, you could go ahead and figure it going from inlet to inlet. But five minutes is the worst case scenario on that. So that's what we're going to just assume on this particular project. That determination will be done by the design engineer. We've got our time of concentration line. We've got our pre and post development drainage areas. We've got our pre and post for our time of concentration line too. Now we need our soils. All right, our soils types. Now where do we go and get our soils information? There's a great website that's the USDA Soil Survey website. I'm going to show you that real quick. I'm going to open up a window in Google Chrome. I'll just go to Google and I'll do a search for USDA soils survey and my soils survey homepage will come up I'll select start WSS and a map of the United States will show up now we're going to zoom to the location uh, that we're interested in so I'm going to zoom into southwest Missouri here I will probably have to zoom a couple times I'm looking for Ozark which is right in here and we're looking for our subdivision area, which is right in this area right here. Now you'll see houses and everything. This, this data set is already developed, um, but we're going to go ahead and use it anyway. So once we've zoomed into the area that we are wanting to get soils for, we can, we can actually create an AOI, which is AOI stands for area of interest. So you can see our detention pond area right here. This is what we're designing for. So I'm going to go ahead and create an AOI in this area right here. All right, so once our area of interest has been created, we can select soil map at the top and it will give us all of the different map unit symbols and the map unit names, acreage and the percent of the area of interest. So you can see that we do have some areas that are uh, different soil types. So we would want to export these lines as a shape file. All right, and we can bring those in using map import. We're not going to do that today, um, but you can export these as a shape file, like I said, and bring those directly into uh, Civil 3D. So I could just select download soils data and it will create a download link. And then you simply select the link and it downloads. Now let's go back to the soil map. So we can look at preliminarily before we bring these in, we can look and see what kind of soils we have. So 70009 is going to be part of our area here you can see that designation right here so I'm going to select map unit name and we can see that that is a soil type C 
So we do have different soil types for these areas, so we would need to overlay this information onto our model and then figure the areas for each different soil designation. So the soil designations are A, B, C, and D. All right, so this is key whenever we start to uh, gather the information for our runoff curve number. So I'll go ahead and I'll select uh, 70022 because that was another one. And that's a soil type D, you can see right here. And 70022 is going to be the rest of our area. All right, so this area here would be the area for soil type C, and the rest of it would be soil type D. We'll just take an average for this demonstration and uh, plug the numbers in. All right, so now we've got everything that we need since we've got our soils information, or we've gone out and gotten our soils information, and we have our pre and our post development drainage areas and our TC for the pre and the post. So we're ready to start entering this information into SSA. Once inside of SSA, there are a couple of sets of settings that we need to be sure are set up correctly. So if we select the input tab and select our project options, we need to be sure that we're, our hydraulic method for this particular case is going to be SCS TR55. The time of concentration method will be the same. The minimum allowable time of concentration, if you see TC or TOC, that's time of concentration. The minimum allowed is five minutes. That's pretty standard across the board. So we need to be sure that we are using those hydraulic methods uh, for, in this particular instance. Now we do have all these other hydraulic methods that you could select from or choose from. We have the EPA swim, rational, modified rational, and HEC-1. Uh, other than TR-55 or TR-20, these are widely used hydrology methods, uh, so you should be able to pick one of those and uh, it be the one you need. So we're going to pick TR-55. The second thing we need to do is go to analysis and select our analysis options. And we want to be sure right now, this is the first thing we're doing, is we're going to select an end analysis time. So we, we're doing a 24-hour event, so we need to just pick the next day. Okay, these dates and times don't necessarily matter uh, as long as they're a day apart. So it's 24 hours. And we'll hit OK. Now the first thing I do is I want to create what's called a rainfall gauge. This is where you apply your rainfall intensities. So I'm going to select add a rain gauge and just pick a point on my screen and select escape. Once your rainfall gauge is in your model, just double click on it. And we're going to call, we can leave this rain gauge ID whatever you want. You can name it whatever you want. I'm just going to leave it what it default, the default name is. I'm going to go ahead and select a time series. So we're going to design for the 2, the 25, and the 100 year storm. I'm going to select my ellipsis here next to time series. And I'm going to add a time series. All right, we'll call this 2 year. And we'll select our rainfall designer. The rainfall designer is going to give us all the information for the United States. So we're in Missouri. The type of unit intensity that we're going to use is SCS type 2 24 hour. This is pretty typical uh, for this area in the Midwest. So we're going to select the county, which the Christian is the county we are in, and I'll select the two year storm and it gives me my rainfall depth. Now this is all provided for you, so you don't have to go out and look it up. It would be in the soil conservation survey information if you got that from your particular county or parish but uh, right here in the rainfall designer it's right at your fingertips so I'll go ahead and hit OK and it adds that particular time series now we need to do two more because I said we we're gonna design to the two ten I'm sorry the two twenty five and a hundred year storm so I'm gonna add we'll call this twenty five year I'll select my rainfall designer and I'll select twenty five year and hit OK. One more. I'll add another one. We'll call this 100 year. We'll select our rainfall designer and change this to 100 year. And hit OK. Now after we've got these added, all we have to do is just select close. And close. Now our rain gauge is set up. This is what's going to apply the intensity of, of storms and allow us to select the different storms to route, our, route through our pond. So the next thing we do is we're going to go up and we're going to select add a sub basin. 
And I'm just going to draw a subbasin here on the screen. To close it, you double click. I'm going to build one for the pre, and I'm going to build one for the post. Now, let's fill out the pre information first. So I'm going to select the one the subbasin I drew for my pre development, and I'm going to name it just that. Pre development. Notice we have our SCSTR55 TOC, our time of concentration tab, and our curve number. We'll get to curve number here in a minute. We know that our pre-development drainage area uh, is 14.90 acres. We got that from our catchment in Civil 3D. So I go ahead and fill that out for the area. We'll go ahead and select the TR55 TOC tab. And we've got three different areas here that we need to fill out for time of concentration. And these are all pretty typical. So you'll hear sheet flow, shallow concentrated flow, and channelized flow. In this particular instance, we're going to use sheet flow and shallow concentrated flow. Again, these determinations will be done by the design engineer. So for sheet flow, the maximum allowable distance that you can go with sheet flow is 300 feet. Since this is a pasture, there's actually been cattle run on this and everything. In the past, it's in good condition now. Since it is pasture, we are going to go ahead and use 300 feet. If this happens to go through a particular uh, subdivision or something like that, you probably want to use 100 feet because that's what the, the reviewing agency is probably going to have you do. In this particular instance, we will go 300 feet. we got to give it a Manning's roughness coefficient first. So if you don't know what that Manning's N is, then you can select the ellipsis. And it gives you all of the different Manning's ends for the different cover. We've got a little bit of, of range here that we can use. It's dense grass, or it could be poor grass cover, moderately rough surface, so on and so forth. In this particular instance, we're going to use 0 0.24. And our flow length will be 300 feet. Our slope, we calculated our slope uh, by looking at the contours in Civil 3D and the distance along the line. So if I, if I go back over to my TC line that I have here, I broke it up into a 300 foot increment and did a little bit of math there and got the percentage of grade. So that percentage of grade is 5.14%. Make sure that you put it in a percent and not in decimal form. So what I mean by that is 0.0514. It is in percent, so make sure it's put in that way. Then select your two year, 24 hour rainfall. And you can select your, your ellipsis here and it will automatically fill that out for you, pulling that from the rainfall data. We started off, we've got 21.34 minutes of time of concentration so far, but we haven't gone the whole distance. So we need to select the rest of it, which would be shallow concentrated flow. The rest of the distance, the flow length from the end of the 300 feet to the pond um, along our time of concentration line is 1,326 feet. And our slope is 3.38%. Our surface type is unpaved. You could actually say whether it was a grass waterway, you know, select one of these other types. We're just going to use unpaved and it adds more time of concentration. All right, so when you think of time of concentration, think of dumping a bucket of water on the ground and how long it takes that bucket of water to get to your detention pond. That's what we're figuring here. So everything with detention is really wrapped around a time rate of change. So I'll go ahead and go to the top here and select my rainfall gauge. And then I'll go ahead and enter my curve number information. So right now, it's got my entire area set to a curve number of 72. Now, how did it come to this? Well, remember we have the soil groups that we've added to our, our model. And we've, we've done our calculations. So we had a soil type C and a soil type D. Where do I figure out how to get this curve number. Well, if I select the ellipsis here under select curve number, a table will come up that's got all of the different types of ground or ground cover or developments uh, that you would be designing to. So I'm going to scroll down to pasture, grassland, or range, and it's in good condition. So for soil type C, we look at our C column, we drop down, and we select 74. Now it's not the entire area, all right? For our soil type C, we had 5.7 acres. We know that if we have 5.7 acres and our actual overall area was 14.9, we just subtract the two and that's what we have for our soil type D. All right, and remember, that's coming from the soil survey website that we just were at. So 9.2 is going to be the area for our second area, which would be our soil type D. 
So we'll go ahead and select that curve number again, but we're going to select it this time and it's going to be a soil type D number. So pasture grassland, good condition, and here's our soil type D. So that gives us what's called a weighted curve number of 77.70. That's just an average is what that is, taken into account for the percentage of area for our overall pre-development drainage area. Once that's selected, we can hit close and we want to save. Once we've saved our project, we're going to go ahead and fill out the same information for our post. Now the post development condition, if you remember if I go back to Civil 3D here, our post development drainage area is this yellow drainage area right here. Now again that's going to be a lot more area and if we were to, to list this or run an area on this uh, using uh, the analyze tab in the ribbon and selecting area here for inquiry, it would tell us that our overall area is 23.74 acres. Okay, so that's a lot more area than what we had for our pre. Again, this is this is uh, not necessarily typical, but happens all the time. So don't be alarmed if your post development area is larger. So I'll go ahead and I'll put in 23.74, and we'll fill out the same information. And we want to be sure that we name our subbasin, and we'll go ahead and pick our rain gauge. Our time of concentration is going to be shorter. All right, because again, if we go back to Civil 3D and I turn on my post development time of concentration, so you can see that it's following the same line as the pre, except when it gets to the road here, we're just going to assume five minutes to the pond because again, it's in channelized flow, meaning it's inside of a pipe, so it's going to be traveling at a lot faster velocity. So again, I've broken this up and we're going to use, since there's, there's subdivision lots here, and we're traveling across the back of the lots, we're only going to use 100 foot of sheet flow for the initial run. Our roughness coefficient, if you remember we were selected that ellipsis and we can drop down, we use 0.24 for the pre. This is going to be mowed grass, all right, so it's it could be considered dense, uh, dense turf or dense grass. Um, we're just going to use 0.3 for Manning's in, so 0.3. Our flow length will be 100 for the initial flow. Our slope is 5.14%, and there's our time of concentration. And notice that it is a lot shorter than it was for the, the pre-development. We'll select our shallow concentrated flow, and we have 415 foot of additional flow for shallow concentration until it gets to our road. When it gets to the road again, it's in a channelized condition. So five minutes is a conservative number. If we're sloping, or if we look at the slope on that, for that 415 feet, it's 4.39%, and it calculates the rest of our flow time. Now I can select a TOC report here, the TOC report tab. I can scroll down and it gives me the cumulative TOC. Now we just need to fill out the curve number. So again, you have to look at the, the soil survey. So when you import those lines uh, from a shape file from the soil conservation map, you will have those overlapped on top of your model in Civil 3D, and you can get the appropriate areas that you need. The areas that we calculated, or that I went back and calculated, are 13.25. Uh, All right, and this is going to be for the soil type C. So when we select our curve number, we picked pasture before. Well, this is a developed condition now for the post, or the post-developed condition. So these are third-acre lots. So we look at residential districts, third acre lots, and we move to the right and we select our soil type C and hit OK. So the additional area that we're going to have for uh, our soil type D designation is 10.49 acres. And we'll go ahead and select third acre lots and we'll move to the soil type D curve number. Again, this is going to give us a weighted curve number. And this is the disparity that you have that generates the detention. So we're actually, we're not catching more water, or we're, not, we're not moving more water. We're basically taking into account for different surfaces, all right? Meaning we're going to have pavement now. We're going to have storm inlets. Um, all of that stuff is impervious. So what that means is water won't go through it. So it's going to move a lot faster on that type of surface than it would in a, on a open pasture. Um, this is again, this is why uh, SSA calculates the way it does. It reads the pre and the post curve numbers, the pre and the post TC, and it does the calculation. We'll go ahead and hit close because that's filled out. Now we're ready to see the disparity between the two. So I'm going to go ahead and create an outlet. 
and I'll create two outlets. And then I'm going to select my pre-development basin. I'm going to right click and select connect to and just pick my outlet. I'll do the same thing here with my post. Pick my outlet. So the next thing I need to do is go up to analysis and analysis options and I need to pick my my time series. So I'm going to start off with the two year. Hit OK and I'll run it. And if I pick my air, my sub basin, it tells me that I have 23.82 CFS for the pre. That's the two year pre. The two year post is 68.88. So if you did the subtraction between those two numbers, that's how much storage that we have to have in CFS for the detention pond. Right? So we would run our calculations through for the 2, the 25, and the 100 exactly the way that I just showed you right there. So we're back here in Civil 3D. And what we want to do is we want to go ahead and grade our detention pond so that we can get some volumes and then populate our storage node inside of SSA. So I'm going to zoom in here where our detention area is at, and I've already got an outline of the pond shown of what I think the bottom needs to look like. And again, this can change. We can make this any shape that we'd like. But what I want to show you is, is that this is just a feature line. All right? And this feature line, if I look at the elevation editor, it's set to be that the bottom of the pond is, is sloping at 1%. Okay, so you're going to see a few percentages that are a little bit different. This particular instance, um, when I get to this point right here, um, you can see the green triangle here if I zoom in. You can see as I go around that, that curve there, it's at 0.02%. Well, I want it to stay pretty flat across there because that's the back of the pond, and it needs to be one consistent elevation around that, around that curve. So that's, that's the, the reason that I did it that way. Everything will flow pretty much at 1% from the south side of the pond to the north. We're going to drain the pond here at the north end of the pond. So I'm going to use the grading tools inside of Civil 3D to go ahead and create this pond. So I'm going to set up, make sure everything's set up correctly. I'm going to select my pond site. That's what site my feature line's in. And I'll go ahead and select my surface. It's going to daylight to. It's all good. And I'm going to grade to a specific elevation. All right. The reason I'm going to grade to a specific elevation is because I know at the top of the pond I need there to be a berm at the top. So the bottom of the pond at the north end is at 961, I believe. So the back of the pond is at around 963. So it'll slope at the bottom of the pond and go up to an absolute elevation or, or an elevation. So I'm going to select Create Grading. I'll pick my feature line. We're going to weed out the feature line, and I'll pick to the outside because I want it to grade the entire length. And we're going to go up to elevation 969 just to start. So there's one little caveat to this. Um, in order for the stage storage chart, which is what we're going to pull next, um, in order for it to read out a complete contour elevation at 969, which is what we need, which will be the top of the pond, we need to, to make sure that we go above that a little bit when we grade so that it'll have a full contour to read. So I'm going to take this to 969.10. just has to be a tenth of a foot higher. We can come back and adjust this later. So our slopes for cut and fill are going to be 3 to 1. So now that we've got the outside of the pond, or actually the inside slope of the pond, graded to 969.10, now what we can do is, is create what's called an infill so that it will give us the bottom of our pond. So I'm going to go ahead and select Create Infill, and I'm just going to pick inside of our pond, and our infill is created. One thing we need to be sure of is that we've got a surface that's being built from our grading object or our grading tools from our grading tools inside of Civil 3D. So now you can see that we do have the inside of our pond. So I can look at this in the object viewer and I can see that we have a nice inside shape of our pond. So now in order to create a stage storage chart so that we can get the volume of what this pond is and we can start to iterate inside of SSA uh, as to how big our pond needs to be, we can create what's called a stage storage chart. So if I go to Analyze and Design and select Stage Storage, I can start to fill out the dialog boxes here in the stage storage chart. So the volume calculation method we're going to use, we're going to tell it to, to create both average end area and conic approximation. We're going to use the average end area numbers, but I like to look at both. So I'm going to select Define Basin. And then we will define the basin from surface contours. We'll just hit define and select our contours. And here are our volumes of our pond. 
All right, so we're at 100 and, well, it's conic. The average end area, we're at 111,241 cubic feet. All right, that's a good place to start. So we'll know real quick whether this pond's going to hold what we need or not. So I'm going to hit Save Table. And I'm going to save this table out I'm underneath my, my project here. And I'm just going to call this Detention Pond 1. All right, and the one is going to represent the, the first solution that we came up with. I'll hit Save and Cancel, and we're ready to jump back into SSA. So if I select SSA, very quickly, I can create my storage node. So I'm going to delete my outlet or my outfall here from my post-development drainage area. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select a drainage or a storage node, and I'll stick that node right here. This is representing our pond. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up, and we'll call this, uh, we'll just call it pond. Our invert elevation, this is the bottom of the pond, so our invert elevation is at 961, and our max elevation is 969, so that's the top of the pond that we wanted to read. Our initial water surface elevation is going to be 961, so if we were doing a wet pond, we could make this higher, so if we had water that was staying inside of it at all times, say maybe two foot of water, that water surface ele elevation might be 963. But we're going to drain this pond, so it's going to be the bottom. The storage type that we're going to use is a storage curve. Now, we just pulled that storage curve information from our stage storage chart by using our stage storage chart. So I'm going to go ahead and add a storage curve. So I'm just going to go up and, and select Add, and we'll call this our pond. I'm going to load that file that we just exported from, for our stage storage chart. So I will change my file type to the AECCSST file format, and I will select Detention Pond 1 and hit Open. And notice it gives us our curves. All right. One, thing, one key thing to note here, sometimes it will bring in elevations instead of depth. We need to be sure that this is set to depth. So meaning if this said 961, 962, we change those to feet of depth. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, however deep your pond is. In this particular instance, it's 8 feet deep. So we'll go ahead and close that. And everything else here is good to go. We'll select close. And we'll go ahead and connect our subbasin to our pond. Now we'll go ahead and set another outlet or an outfall. I'm going to go ahead and double click on that outfall and I'm just going to call it outfall pond. Our invert elevation, um, this is going to be lower than what our, our invert elevation of our pond is, so I'm just going to make it 960, and we'll use a normal boundary condition. Now, the way we're going to drain the pond, so there's nothing to connect the storage node to the outfall right now. We're going to drain the pond with a weir or an orifice. So this is when we start to think about our outlet control structure. Basically what an outlet control structure does is it controls the amount of water that's leaving the pond. So the difference between the pre-development and post-development conditions, that is what's being stored inside of the pond. The, we're not, again, we're not creating more water, we're just getting water from point A to point B faster because of different materials on the ground. What this means, I'm going to jump back here to, to Civil 3D. I drew a little schematic here. What this means, this would be just a, a simple outlet control structure. Um, we've got the option to create orifices, which an orifice is just a hole in like a concrete wall. All right, or we can create an outlet structure that's rectangular. Um, there's, a, there's, this is just one way to do it. This is what we're going to do today. And this can, this shape can, we can make this. It can be multiple rectangular structures. It can it can just look like this simple notch inside the wall with these two orifices. It can make you can make it look any way you want as long as it's flowing what it needs to flow in SSA. Now we have to match the pre-development number in SSA. I wanted to show you what the outlet control structure might look like. So we'll get back to SSA. I'm going to start off by just creating an orifice just to drain the pond so it'll start to drain. So when I select Add Orifice, I'm going to pull my orifice out here and draw a line from my storage node to my outfall, and this will read my orifice. I'm going to double click on that orifice, and I'm not going to name it or anything. We're just going to start off with, let's just say, an 18-inch orifice, and the crest elevation is where 
basically the invert is. So it's at the bottom of the pond. Your coefficient will leave alone. And I'm just going to hit close. Now, we can route this again, all right, or we can run the calculation. But we need to be sure we're running to the two-year storm because that's where we want to start. So I'm going to select analysis and analysis options, and I'll go ahead and set it to two-year, and I'll run it. We can start to pull elevation numbers, uh, storage volume numbers. Uh, we want to be sure that we are, again, hitting the pre-development number. So our pre-development number for this particular storm, which is the two-year, was 23.82 CFS. All right, so I need to look here at our storage node. We can see that we have five feet of depth. The water elevation in the pond is 966.32, so it's coming up 5.32 feet from the bottom. And this is our peak inflow. Now, this is not the number that we're releasing this is the number we're releasing, 18.62. So we're below right now. I'll just double click on this outlet. We're below what our, our max flow for our two year storm is. What I like to do then, and, and again, this is completely up to you on whether you go ahead and make it flow uh, what the two year pre will allow, or you can go ahead and check the other storms. So I'm just going to see if we can even contain the 100 year. All right, I'm going to run that. And you'll see that our pond is overtopped, all right? So we know that we need to add more to our outlet structure. Let's just add a rectangular weir, all right? So we're going to add a weir to this side. Our orifice is set to an 18 inch, and it's starting at the bottom of the pond. We'll double click on our weir, our crest elevation. So we're going from 961 up 18 inches for our, our orifice, and I want to be above that with my weir. The top of the orifice would be at 962.50, so I'm going to bring my crest invert elevation of my weir to where it starts to flow out of this rectangular portion of the outlet structure to 967, just to, just to throw something out here. This is the design portion of the tension pond design. You're going to have to iterate. Okay, so the crest length, let's just make it four feet long to start and see what it starts to to flow. So the total weir height, this is going to be from the crest elevation at 967 to 969. This is the to the top of the pond. Our shape is going to be rectangular. We'll leave our coefficient alone. And we'll hit close. And we'll just go ahead and run it and see what it does. All right, we're still overflowing. All right, so we've got 182 CFS we're trying to push out. And we can flow, or we're flowing 61.12 CFS out of our outlet control structure. Now we have a max allowable of 73.09 CFS, so we could actually make this a little wider. All right, so we could double click on our rectangular weir, and we can go ahead and say, let's make it six feet wide and rerun it and see what we get. Now I, I believe we're going to be over. Yeah, 79.96. Okay, we're over the amount of what we can what we can flow. And I'll bet you that if we go back here and select our 25 and run it real quick just to see where we're at, our pond is not big enough. There's too much water going out, which means we're going to have to make our pond bigger. We can do that very simply back in Civil 3D with the grading tools. All right, so we'll just jump back into Civil 3D. We're going to simply just start dragging this feature line around. We're going to run the stage storage chart again. So this particular feature line has got a lot of PIs, so you'll have to bear with me here just a minute. And we'll just move this, this pond out. Again, you can make this any shape that you want, but every time that we move one of these PIs, we're creating more volume inside of our pond. So we want to just bring our our pond out and again you can make this any shape that you want just be sure to not make it a, a regular shape to where it uh, bow ties back on itself in the grating. I'm going to come back and go to stage storage we will redefine our stage storage chart by selecting our pond and you can see here we've got 100, 138,000 cubic feet of storage now which is a lot larger than what we had before so we'll just save this table, and we'll call it uh, Tension Pond 2. It's a second iteration. And we'll simply open our storage node 
and load our stage storage chart again. And notice that we now have the additional storage. So let's just go ahead and run it and see what we've got. So I'm going to go ahead and run. And our pond is now big enough, we know, for at least, I believe this was the 25-year storm. So let's go ahead and bump it up to the 100, and we'll rerun it. So we can see that we're still overtopping, but are we releasing the amount that we can actually release uh, for, for the pre-development? So we're releasing right now 79.96, and we can only release 73. So we know that our pond's going to have to get bigger. So again, this is, this is something that you'll iterate. could be three or four times. You might get it the second time. It's really just, it is designed. So don't feel bad if you have to adjust your pond. This is something that all design engineers uh, need to go through or have to go through for each project. So you just keep making this pond a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and a little bit bigger. All right, so now we'll go ahead and run this and see if we've got enough storage. So we'll go back to Analyze and Stage Storage. We'll define our surface again. And look, we've got 156,000 cubes now. So we're going to save this table, and we'll call it 3. So that's iteration 3. We'll go ahead and load that curve. All right, and we can check it so we can be sure that it loaded correctly right here, 156,000. And we'll go ahead and run it because we should still be on uh, our storm selected should still be the 100 year. Go ahead and run. And we're still not big enough. Let's see what we're flowing out, 79.76. So we're going to have to continue to move this pond out and make it bigger or actually come up and you know, give it another foot of depth. So if we're going to change the elevation here of the pond, let's go up to, we're at 969, let's go up to 971. We still have to take into account for grading on the outside of our pond. So we want to kind of keep in mind where we're at size-wise. And these are, again, are design aspects that you look at whenever you're doing detention pond design. For this instance here, we're going to go ahead and just raise this to 971. So what I'm going to do is go back to my grading creation tools. And I'm going to edit my grading. So I'm going to pick here in my slope of my pond. So my grading elevation is going to be 971.10 so that we can get a full contour at the top. And we'll leave it 3 to 1. And it grades it to where it needs to be. So we'll go ahead and get a stage storage chart for that. So we'll go to Analyze and select Stage Storage. Again, I'm going to go a little quicker here. We've done this several times. So I'm going to save my table. Now, there are a couple things that we'll have to change in this uh, storage curve. Um, number one, we need to reload the curve. So we're going to reload it. And notice that we now have a higher depth. Okay, so we've got 10 foot of depth. All right, there's a lot of area going to this pond. So that's why this pond is so big. Uh, you're going to have a broad range of sizes when you did when you design detention, uh, but this one, this is a pretty large pond. So we've got our extra depth there. Since we have our extra depth, we need to change this maximum elevation to 971. And we rerun the pond. We can actually contain our flow. So 969.33 is the max water surface elevation. We're releasing 95.27. Now that's a whole lot more than what we what we are able to release because our pre-development release rate is 73. So we're going to have to start choking this back and seeing if we can actually contain in our newly sized pond the flow. So we've still got about, if we look here, 960 now, we've still got about a foot and a half, a little over a foot and a half, maybe foot and three quarters of, of, of storage inside of our pond. So what we'll do to raise that is we will just... Let's go ahead and make this 971, and we'll make this a three-foot wide crest. Just by those changes, we've knocked it down to 72.09. Now, we can actually release 73.09. So as of now, we have stored the 100-year, and that's what we were after. So our max water surface elevation is 969.82. All right, so if you had to have a foot of freeboard, which is a requirement by a lot of municipalities, 
the top of our pond's at 971, so we would have our foot of freeboard. So the last thing I do is check to see if we are actually flowing and meeting all of the pre-development requirements for all the other storms. So the 2, the 25, and the 100. So we'll go back to the 2, and we'll run it again. And it's as simple to check by just selecting the outfall, 16.39 CFS, and we're allowed to flow 23. So we could actually start to flow a little bit more water. So we could, we could either add another orifice or we could add a rectangular uh, weir. Um, if we wanted to flow a little bit more, we'll leave it there for right now. We're going to go ahead and select our 25 year. And we'll run that. All right, so I, I am now flowing 44.84 CFS. That's what I'm releasing out of my pond. And I can see that I can actually add more flow to that. So let's look at the elevation inside of the pond. So 968.69, that's where the, the top of the 25-year storm is hitting inside of the pond. So there's a lot of different ways that we could get to this. I'll show you one method, but this is, again, this is iteration on trying to uh, narrow down how much water you want to actually flow. The, the more that we let it flow, the lower the water surface elevation in our pond here and the, the smaller amount of grading that we have to do for our pond and the smaller amount of area that our pond actually has to take up on our lot. So we want to get those numbers as close as we can. So what I can do, I'm going to go ahead and change this orifice. I'm going to change it to a 12-inch orifice, and I'm going to add another orifice. So I'm going to come down here, and I will add... It's just a 12-inch orifice, and the crest elevation will be the same thing at the bottom of the pond. So let's go back to our two-year and see how this affects us. So we're releasing 15.12. We can release 23.75. So we will bump the size of those orifices back up. So there's two orifices here. Now we're releasing 28.38. So again, we can only release 23.75. So this is what I talk about when I'm saying we're, we're going to have to iterate. Okay, you just, you, you're basically, you're designing right now. So I'm going to, let's add, make that, orf, that second orifice a 12 inch. 22.24. That's really close to our 23.75. It's always better to release less than the pre-developed number or the pre-developed allowable rate because you can always, you know, come back and say, well, hey, we're releasing less than what was actually going there in the beginning. So we've got our two sized, our two-year storm with our two orifices. So let's go back, change to the 25-year storm, and let's run it again and see where we're at. Because we're releasing more in the two-year, we're going to obviously be releasing more in the 25. So we're releasing now 45.52 CFS, and we can release 56. That's quite a bit of disparity. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop the elevation that the water starts flowing through my weir. All right, so I'm going to drop this to 965, and I'll select Run. So now we're releasing 69.46, and obviously that's too much. So again, iteration. Uh, we're just we're we're testing the waters here. Come up to 966. Fifty-seven point two nine CFS is how much we're flowing, and see we're just we're right there. So we need to go ahead and bring that up just a little more. So we'll say 966.50. And 51.31 is what we are flowing, and we're allowed 56. So let's go ahead and look at the 100-year just to be sure that we're not overtopping or flowing too much. 
So we're flowing 78.28, and we have to choke it back to 73.09. So sometimes you have to, to, to get the 100-year storm to actually uh, be contained and, and flow out of that outlet structure at the correct rate. You know, we might, we might be a little bit less on the 25-year storm, which is not a big deal. So we'll just drop this back to, say, 2.75. And we'll rerun it. 75.29. So slowly but surely, we're getting back. We'll go ahead and say 2.3. I don't want you to think this is guesswork. This is design. We're designing this pond. So we're checking these flows to be sure that we're good to go. 71.32. That's where we're going to leave it today. So we know that all of our storms will route through our pond and we're releasing less than what was there pre-developed. So if I double click on my pond, I can see my max surface elevation for the 100 year. All right, because that's the last storm that we routed. We know that the top of our pond's at 971. We've got, you know, enough for freeboard if we have to have a foot of freeboard. Um, I've actually seen it to where some places allow, or want you to have two foot of freeboard. So we'd have to go back and make our pond a little bit bigger. One thing to keep in mind, if you're having a hard time meeting your uh, pre-developed CFS, always look at making your pond a little bit bigger because the more volume you have, the lower the water surface elevation will be and the easier it's going to be to meet those pre-developed numbers. Now, sometimes if you're constrained by area, uh, you're going to have to just iterate with the weir and the uh, outlet control structure to, to kind of tweak it to see if you can meet those requirements. So if we jump back to Civil 3D, we can see this is the size of pond that we need. We're good to go. And we can go ahead and do our grading for the berm and for the outside of the pond. And then our detention pond is designed. So remember, getting the pond size correctly the first round is sometimes hard to do. So you might need to iterate. And I would say you're always most likely going to need to adjust your pond. Uh, it's a little bit rough to get that the exact size correct every single time. So don't feel bad if you need to iterate. This concludes Episode 2. I'd like to thank you for watching. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is printing a report here for our detention. So I'm going to go up to rerun the, I'll go ahead and run the analysis one more time. And we were running the analysis for the 100 year storm. I can go up to the output menu and I can select generate a custom report. And I'll just tell it yes to overwrite it. We may have written this report before just to, to take a look at it and see, uh, just kind of review. Uh, but now we're, we're going to print it out so that we can use it for submittal. So you can see it gives us a nice 12-page uh, report here. We can kind of scroll through. gives us all the information that we input. This is huge here, the sub-basin information. This is what a reviewing agent is going to look at, the acreage, the curve numbers, the rainfall intensity, so on and so forth. So this gives the reviewing agency everything that they need to verify that your design is correct. This concludes episode two. I'd like to thank you for watching and hope you have a great day.